Uh, well, uh, welcome everybody to the Hackney Empire. Uh, I never thought I'd be playing this theatre in such distinguished company or in any company at all. Uh, it's a fantastic pleasure to be here. My name's Mark Swenerton. Uh, I've also had the pleasure of working on the projects designed by Neve Brown and his colleagues at Camden for, I've been working on that for nearly 10 years. And during that time, I feel I've learned so much about housing. It's been a real education for me to have that very close relationship. So it's really fantastic for me now to see Neve having been awarded the RIBA Royal Gold Medal for Architecture, to be talking about his work, and particularly in company with three such distinguished architects, because we've got uh, in Peter Ahrens, Farshid Musavi, and Stephen Bates, we've got an extraordinary assemblage of expertise in architecture and in housing, extending back over the last 50 years or so. So it's great to have them, very welcome to all three, as respondents to uh, Neve's uh, comments. Uh, we've got a, uh, a sort of series of little packages that we're going to do in, during the course of the evening. Um, first of all, Neve is going to uh, make some comments uh, without slides relating to the political situation that we find ourselves in today. And we're then going to follow that immediately by a little section with slides on some detail aspects of the design of Alexandra Road. After that, we will then go into a more freewheeling conversation, uh, bringing in our respondents, and then during that, we will have the loop tape running. And then to end with, Neve has made a little presentation on his final project, the Medina at Eindhoven, which I think for many people is not sufficiently known. So I think without further ado, I will hand over to Neve and ask him to get us underway with his opening remarks. Thank you. The ado is no mine. Fortunately, I look at you all and I can't see you. <laughs> and that would be quite terrifying. I gave a presentation not very long ago, and in the context of doing that, I surprised people, I think, by giving forth a little bit about the current problem. And I have been asked by a surprising number of people more or less repeat it. So that's what I will begin with, and it has to do with the consequence of the fire. And the fact that there is an inquiry going on on the fire, and the inquiry is very important, and the man who's running the inquiry said he's going to find everything and do everything, and that he'll pin down guilt if need be, and all of that. And that's where the concentration is. But in some curious way, the concentration should be on how we deal with the situation after the fire. Because there are multiple buildings throughout the country that are not only at risk in the way that that building was at risk, but others that are at risk in the sense of their social uh, ineptitude in dealing with the integration of a society and a culture. And I did remind people last time that we as a nation have had rules and regulations about the way we have dealt with housing ever since after the fire of London. And even before that, when we were making big squares and things with legal buildings and long and continuous buildings, we made buildings which made spaces, which made continuity, which made a place in the city and which made places for buildings within that context. So we have a long history of that. And then after that we had the four classes of housing, which gave us housing from the, for the very rich down to the relatively low income, but high enough income to live in cities. And we have s s streets in London, around the corners of which you have first class, second class, third class housing and in Dublin and other places you have that around the corner, and a four-class housing. That housing continued until virtually the slum building in the Industrial Revolution. 
when we were building the most appalling building for both the residents that were there and for the new crowds that came in. And they dealt, dealt with that a bit with Bible housing, which then came and intervened up to the second, for the First World War. And after the First World War, then they were going to do decent homes. And they invented decent homes, and they did the homes that were then built then, from 1917 to 1920, and then 27, 24, they wanted to restrict the costs, and 27, they had to stop them because of the uh, economic crisis, and after all, when the, the, the Depression came along, that was stopped totally. And then, after the Second World War, they had our then uh, homes program then, and that too was committed. Now, both, all these schemes, had a major, major defect in them, insofar as they were financed for the building of the scheme, but there was no formul formed, formulated, strict pattern and commitment for the finance of the maintenance of the buildings. So those buildings, the money that was supposed to go to them, went through local authorities, it was deflected into other things, and we have never maintained our buildings. After that, we then had uh, Homes for Today and Tomorrow, and the HCY1, and the whole business that went with that new kind of housing, which was an incredibly sound, good set of programs. But yet again, we gave no finance to the life of the building. The building started to deteriorate. Margaret Thatcher came in. There was a restriction on all money that went to councils. Councils simply didn't have enough money to meet their commitments. The legal commitments were such that when they got money for housing, they deflected it into other things, and the housing was never maintained. So, we have a problem. We have the problem of the housing that is built there, and we have the problem of how we actually then cope with our current situation. I made a suggestion, it's the only suggestion, but I'd like to make my point being that if my suggestion is inadequate, the grounds on which I am making those suggestions need to be recognized. The first thing that we need to do is to set up a program which <clears throat> gives us a new way of actually finding how we do housing. Now, I am suggesting that we turn the top clock back to before Margaret Thatcher, to the HCI1, to the Better Homes, to the program that we had then, and the finance system that we had then, and that exists. It can be deflected into many different courses, it can be done in many different situations. We set up an authority that actually then governs that use and then de deals with it in the other local authorities that it goes along and suggests programs. And also to do this, we need to set it up so it has the freedom to actually break certain kinds of rules that are necessary, density, car parking, access, staircases, density, all of those things need to be dealt with then flexibly by the new authority, and in not all schemes need to conform to exactly the same standards. That is the basis of getting underway, it seems to me. And then, uh, after that, we have another program. And the program that we must then set up is the one which looks after the building for the life of the building. Now, we have worked, I have worked abroad, we've worked in the Netherlands, we've done we're familiar with things that happen in Germany, familiar with things that happen elsewhere. They set up their programs with housing associations, housing societies, also the local authorities, and the private sector. And they combine together as a group joint interests. Sometimes it's single, sometimes it's groups, sometimes it's the whole lot together. And they sort it out as a program. It is then financed by the housing associations in such a way that maintenance is financed for the life of the building and can't be touched politically, so that they have a way of looking after it. The interesting thing being, almost immediately the buildings, including the lowest social standard ones, start to acquire an equity which is used to finance the next buildings because the buildings are in proper order. Now, we have to change our system to be immediate now and flexible, and then to be long-term so that it can actually do the same sort of thing and is not vulnerable to changes in politics or changes in the economy. And in that way, we can rebuild our society. And that takes us 
to the next problem. Because as far as I'm concerned, <coughs> what we have done with the housing after the period when I was working on it in Camden and people were working on it and it then changed <coughs> with uh, the changes of government and changes of attitude, we no longer then found ourselves able to do sponsored work that was at a high level of work for what we then called social housing. Now, as far as my own attitude was concerned, as far as doing that kind of thing was involved, it was social housing indeed, because immediately after the war, or shortly after the war, there was no other alternative but to do the social housing. And that was the social housing for relatively low-income people and low-income people. In my attitude, and I think the attitude of the friends of people that we then did it with, <coughs> the point of that was that it would then no longer be just social housing for low income. We were trying to build housing. And the housing that we were building was housing that belonged, contributed, belonged to the neighborhood, belonged to the whole area, and was adaptable, livable, so on, and not designed simply for a lower income class. And the interesting thing is that that is what is happening, even though it's happening in a way that I didn't personally endorse with leasehold. So that would be the next thing. Now, I think we ought to... We will move on to Alexandra Road. I think we should move yeah. on to Alexandra Road. OK. Well, I think that... Thank you, Neil, because I think that, that paints the big picture and the context within which we are working and in which we're trying to resolve these issues. And I think it would be interesting in the course of the evening to bring in the experience from building in other countries, which our panellists have, as, as well as Neve himself. So we're just going to come out of this PowerPoint. And let me just close this. Okay, so Neve, that's thank you. Okay, there's your pointer. This yep. is a little disconcerting for me to get underway with this kind of thing. I would add, Peter, do you want to? Nineteen seventy-eight. <laughs> you, you can see them on here. Nineteen seventy-eight was when the thing was actually finished. We designed it in nineteen sixty-eight put to committee in 1969, and then there was a period of terrible delay, including road closing orders and all sorts of things. And finally, it wasn't done until 1978. But the thinking goes back to a previous period than that. Next. And that's the scheme, existing housing, railway line, new housing, walkway down to the end, walkway from this end, all the way through, down the ramp, along, the walkway down to the end, and out the other end. Equivalent housing there to that. The integration of adjoining estate there to the same height as that one, as a single composition, unified by the park down the middle, in the old London traditional way, a community center, and got upper terrace overlooking the park and behind it a school. So it conforms to a London tradition. It conforms to an English tradition. It adds to the whole area that it is added, that it uh, put in, and it makes a contribution to the way London works. Next, please. That was an earlier sketch when we started at the end. Housing by me, housing by me, the walkway running through, the scheme as it was more or less built then at that time, an unknown at that area because I didn't know how to design it yet, low housing here, and again the integration of the adjoining estate. That was a fairly early diagram, but an early diagram in the sense that before that diagram takes place, and though people look at these things and see them as, in a sense, almost inevitable in the way they are, to get to that point is a nightmare. 
And I think architects suffer that nightmare. Next, please. Oh, oh dear, we can't see it very well. These are simply exercise diagrams by me to get a kind of feel for the amount of housing that we needed to have. And different, different, no, with no notion at that stage at all of how the actual housing should be. Beginning work, and then the first sort of beginning of a slight sort of layout of the kind of thing that would happen. But even before we had the notion of the continuous walkway. Next. And then, long while after that, the notion of the continuous walkway, which ran all the way through. And by that time, we'd had the idea of the site, the site being cut down underneath, back to the railway, a road underneath, a road underneath, and a way in which that road underneath would naturally be lit and ventilated. And the beginning of an idea of a staircase and already a relatively well-developed notion of the actual building above and the grids that make that work, and a nonsense on the other side. <laughs> and again, the same thing here, and again, a nonsense on the other side, before one had got the idea of the continuous staircase. Now, that staircase is a little like a staircase I had for a scheme that I did quite a number of years earlier, with a staircase going up the middle of the block to front doors. Now, that is a long way along the line of painful, awful work, getting up in the morning, going to bed late at night, not knowing what to do, and gradually ending up with the notion of the setback building and the double level of car parking underneath and the walkway down the middle. That's progress. Next. <laughs> and that was the scheme finally at the end. The existing building integrated Three stories of housing on garages with its walkway there. Four stories, two flats there. The housing behind there, the road behind, the road underneath, the ventilated walkway, the park in the middle, the park going up there and bridging across that road because we had to have vehicle and uh, pedestrian segregation. That was the scheme. Next. And that's the scheme in more detail, and it shows the important aspect of the staircase. Because we start the staircase at the walkway, and it ends up going up the building, past planting at that point, up the building, up the building, back up, back up, back up, gap with light down. And that staircase then it, it is uh, linked to every single front door of the building. And the same thing happens on the building opposite, and the garage is underneath, and it got naturally lit and ventilated, as you can see, like that. And this was a wide frontage, which gave me wide enough for two cars per dwelling, and the light underneath there, and a car per dwelling, and this scheme was a different grid. So we have the geometric problem of two buildings apparently in alignment with each other, to a narrow frontage for a bedroom and a half, as it were, and the wide frontage for two double bedrooms having to be reconciled with each other with dimensions which are difficult to work. Next. And so we ended up with the main building like this. Now, what I want to talk about for a moment, just for the fun of it, I think many of you know the building, is when we've arrived at this situation, roughly, as you see in the sections, we've gone through a nightmare of assessment, creative, complex, joining up thinking to produce something which is, as it were, a walkway, a staircase, a walkway above, and housing in between. And yet that, that looks in a sense obvious, is the product, the end, like a destination of a series of conceptual thoughts. And I want to talk about that a little bit in detail. And that's where I, when I'm going to stop. To begin with, we start the first flight of stairs at the walkway. And somebody walking along there can look at the planting there and can look down at the garage if they ever feel like it. And then the staircase ducks back into the building 
and that you don't invade the property that is next door. The staircase then rises up, 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 and comes out at the top when you can see it. In order that it integrates then with the separation of the dwellings in between, which are these walls, we have those walls there, it changes at that point, and we have a coffer then, which gives identity to each of those terraces. And the same thing down here at the bottom. And then at the very bottom, you can't see it here, I'm afraid, uh, the, and I, I'm afraid you, well, you can't see it there. The entry for the lower dwelling has a cover over it, I'm planting above it, so that the whole thing is, as, as it were, solidly integrated. And you then get the curious thing going of the dwellings, each dwelling is a, a, a height and a half here, a dwelling there with its terrace and its planting bay, giving a pattern up the building that the main intervals horizontally are not the dwelling floor, but the dwelling planting bay. And set back from that is the edge of the dwelling itself and the terrace, and the idea that that is a flat thing and has the slab underneath it. And this, virtually by choice, has a double drip which runs along the edge of it in order that there is an interval there that takes then the glass. And that thing is repeated at that point underneath this one and repeated at that point underneath that one. And at the top, it disappears and you get the parapet. Now, that ends with a parapet here looking down at the garage underneath. You start up the staircase and the staircase itself, in terms of expression, is recessed. So the main interval is the staircase, a bump, a bump for the staircase, and we have the problem of the staircase landings. And for a long while, I had a staircase landing which had a concrete edge all the way across. It then had quite a heavy one, and then I suddenly decided, no, the great thing is the progress of the gap and the interval that is given by that major architectural element up to the parapet at the top. And therefore, we made a very light balustrade on an edge. Now, we have a double edge here, which is vertical, edge, vertical. For the bottom of the staircase, we had a small vertical and then a sloping one back. And the same thing for the next one down, a sloping one back. So that this interval is different from that one and less major than that one, giving a full emphasis on the major divisions. Those major divisions then get run all the way down the building at every two dwelling intervals. And that means that the scale of the building is, is as it were, a double scale because the major element are the staircases. And that is the, as it were, the, the, the hierarchy which takes time and time and time. And these processes that you can see on this diagram here, also each of those has an interval like that, and setting back from it, and you can't see them here, a recess. And that is the actual recess, which is made by the pour of concrete that needs to be done so that you get an accumulated event. Now, it's interesting because the reinforcing, of course, for a wall like that has to do with it being cont continuous. However, the contractor can only pour it in stages so that you have intervals. And I'm sorry, I had hoped that the intervals could show more clearly. Might what? Might show on the next go on, let's go on to the next one. Uh, because the, can we go back if we want to? <laughs> if I want Whatever to go back. Like. What? No, 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 go on. I'm just, yes, yes. Because we have an interval here, an interval there, cut, cutting back, so that that is like that, that is like that, another one here down and up. And worried about the ability to pour this concrete in that kind of way, we actually poured trial walls to make sure that we could get the good edge and get the division so that though it is concrete and continuous, the pile-up of concrete elements that make the building are, as it were, like a series of architectural elements loaded on top of each other to describe both sides of the interval, the major side of the staircase and the, in a sense, the lesser side, 
with, the, with its intervals of the horizontals which divide the dwellings. And you get this major interval, this major series up to the top there, and then finally the parapet running along the top. Now I could witter on longer about that. Here you see again the recess of that one, the minor staircase. The staircase oh, here you see the planting bay, which meant that I could then put a roof across here so you could enter the lower dwelling at the human scale, even though it's a dwelling and a half. Now, all of that, in a sense, is an honest set of divisions coming from an appreciation, so to speak, of the pieces that make the building itself. None of that is artificial or added, in a sense, in a decorative or, or embellishment way. It all comes out of an interpretation of the reality of the building. That's the staircase up. Next, and that's the walkway at the top. And it was kind of a problem to me how that wall then went up to the very top here, at the very top, and then how we made a wall here. And to begin with, I had to simply straight up and down. And then I decided, no, because of this, because of those, this needed to have a lower wall than that one and the balustrades in order that it would be appropriate to the scale of the walkway. And that walkway is then continuous all the way down to the end, where the staircase is going down. So the linkage between that and this walkway is total. The point being, now, we have the 15, you know, it was, it was more than 15 feet interval for the dwellings below, and the problem of the fact that the dwellings here were wider than the ones above. However, the ones below could be the same me measure as the reduced because of the staircases in front. So we have these elements here that are immediately opposite to ones which are the same size, and only at the top do you get the wider, like a cornice, running above the whole building. Now these are architectural issues which trouble the architect and are very difficult to sort out, and uh, Peter Arendt will know that kind of thing. We all go through that and it can be a nightmare of going to bed unhappy and getting up again. The point I'm trying to make is that when you have finished and you've got it right, it looks absolutely right to people and nobody notices or identifies that set of detail at all simply because the thing has become normal. And in a way, it's sort of a bit of a visible loss. Next. <laughs> you get the walkway then coming down to the end. The end staircase is the end of concrete is wider than the cross walls that cross because it had to be wider and because we had to cover the end of the cross walls which were uh, because of the curve which were on a, a, a wedge. We needed to cover that to make the windows the same. We got these very fat walls which gave a proper scale for the repeat elements, big walls, with then the coffers not on the other side, for the, for the only, uh, the only door, reducing therefore the quantity of concrete. And then we have the problem of the top, the thing coming through. And that top element is not the same as the elements below it. And I had a hard time. Then I suddenly decided, no, I will extend it. So it sticks out like that over these, and therefore describes in a way the priority nature of that upper walkway with then this, as I say, floating like a cornice above it. And then the, the concrete lines going back again like elements at the top. Next. And then behind. There you get the staircase sticking out. These are the elements that make it. The staircase, the thing at the back becomes another element, that becomes an element. And I had a nightmare solving this. And I remember talking to uh, um, Gordon Benson, and he said, he reminded me that these elements belong to that heavier part of the building. So what, why did I need to take them higher? So then we invented the double window, which ran all the way along, and this floating like a cornice above, and the slight profiling at that point. So that unifies there. This, this, and I always think of this as looking like the, almost like the back of an armchair, 
that the building actually sits into, and then the railway line. So I have described the difficult, disciplined, irregular, unknown, faulty, do it again, do it again, do it again process to arrive at what you will then end up with, which in a curious way, and it's all right, nobody notices, because <laughs> the thing has become inevitably what it is, a normal place to live. That's the end of my... Neve, thank you. That was it's just marvellous to hear. It's marvellous to hear you talk about the design of Alexandra Road in that absolutely detailed, uh, rigorous way, how each element uh, affects the next one, how it all has to cohere. And as you say, in the end, it coheres to such an extent that nobody realises all the, all the work, all the tricks that you've had to do to to pull that off. But Farshid, I know that you, you visited Alexandra Road with your students from Harvard just recently. I wonder the things that Neve was talking about there, were they picking up on these or were they, were, for them was it all the big, the big moves, the street, the urban level? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that this aspect of, um, of um, you know, Alexander Road and, and talking to, to Neve, I mean, he, he's constantly focusing on talking about each single element in a way as an instrument of the architect. And that really, really hit them because from afar, you know, Alexander Road is, is, a, is a kind of quite an iconic project now uh, for architects. And it has, of course, a very strong social agenda. And the social agenda is easier to read and to, to talk about from afar, but I think the building itself has a power that you must visit because it's only when you go there that you start really noticing that actually architecture itself is, can be highly political because of all its own instruments, because of the handrail, because of the entrances, because of the plant ledge, because of the two sides, because of the central space that the two um, facing sections make and I, I think it's easy for us to forget being in a climate of uh, being disillusioned with our political, you know, the governments and the process of delivery that actually architecture itself can be highly political. And in our everyday uh, jobs as an architect, you know, from the minute we wake up and go to sleep, that we actually carry a lot of agency. And I think this work demonstrates it at every corner. And I, I think they were really hit. They were hit very strongly. Thank you. Well, Neve, I think what we might do is uh, go back onto the loop tape up there, fine, fine. and yes, I'll start firing some questions at you. Fine. Is that okay? Um, is, is that okay? Fine. Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay, so let me just come out of this. So I think, Neve, to step back from the detail of the composition of Alexander Road, just to kind of step back and think about the context of, of this work. In, your, your, in Alexander Road and in your previous project for Camden at Fleet Road, um, you were making a proposition about <coughs> the kind of housing that we should have in cities. Uh, and you were saying, we don't need to build high rise, we should look at continuity and a connection between what we're building and the existing city. And I think it would be interesting for an audience today, 50 years on, to hear a bit about your 
about the, th about the ideas that had, had led you to take up that position. I wondered if you'd like to well, I mean, elaborate on that a bit. It was a long progress. <laughs> and to begin with, one was a student. <clears throat> Bear in mind that we were students at the time, shortly after the war, before there was almost no rebuilding. When we went to the AA in 1950, there were a few schemes that were started. There were two different disciplines in the LCC between those who wanted to do Scandinavian-type blocks and those who wanted to do Corbusier. None of that had been much built, and we were young men and women floundering with the ideas of modernism at that time and deeply involved in Corbusier and then adding to Corbusier a deep involvement in Alva Alto and the whole of modernism, uh, the, 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 the great books that were, that were published at that time. And we were definitely, so to speak, committed to that modernistic idea. And while we were at the AA, we sort of worked our way through that in a way and suddenly realized that the schemes that were like Corbusier, his absolutely wonderful buildings, inspiring buildings, marvelous buildings, and then you would suddenly look at the Ville Radieuse and the fact that the city was literally wiped out with an eraser, and then onto that city were the high buildings for the offices and that low continuous pattern, totally alien to the existing city, and the existing city was reduced, in that sense, to a landscape. And that landscape itself was not even divided or subdivided. It was new buildings in their own form, all together, on uh, cleared sites, with the idea of a total renewal of a culture that involved in itself the rejection of a cult total cultural background. And we became, in a curious way, unhappy with that while we were students. And I can remember in the end, in my fourth year doing a housing scheme, which was Corbusian slabs. And I did that, and so did almost everybody at that stage. But by that time, we were already getting uncomfortable about it all. And realizing that this, in some way, did not fit what we thought England ought to be with rebuilding after the war and in the context of the long set of programs that England has had since the 17th century. And we had an idea that this modernism, with the buildings that we loved, should be reinterpreted into being an integral addition to an existing city, as it were, step by step, with no total overall proposition. And that was indeed a new kind of thinking. And I think that when we, my, my group, several of us after all, Jim Sterling, James Gowan, Alan Cahoon, John Miller, David Gray, me, later Richard McCormack, and others, all worked for Lyons as well and others. And their buildings are insufficiently known now, but the thing that was wonderful for us, as the young people there, drawing at the drawing board every goddamn day, up and down and up and down, doing these endless drawings to put them off, and you gave exactly the same attention to doing a set of precast concrete covers to an upper wall, to a set of doors or windows, to a set of bits of detail, as you gave to the overall concept. And we had the idea of the thorough and complete, complete building through and through, therefore, in some way or other, adjusted at every level to a new notion of context. And I think that was a big idea without us really knowing how big it was when we did it. So it sounds as if this is a sort of ambition that was involved. It wasn't that, it was step by step and step by step. And we did it that way in order that we could sort of move on. And it was not as if this was some huge cultural change. It was a change that was indeed huge in the end, but for us it was just adjusting as we went on and on to. But I think, I think for people looking back today, 50 years on, looking back at the work that you and Gordon Benson, Peter Tarbury and others did at Camden, they're, they're two really major themes that come out from it. The first of those is the one you touched on previously, which is that what, what you were building 
was to be really good homes for anybody, that yes. they weren't just kind of, oh, these will do, you know, these are just for the poor, you know, they'll make do with that. That these, the things that you were building at Alexandra Road are flats, masonettes, houses that anybody would absolutely, you know, die to get their hands on to live in because they are so fantastic. So I think that notion of building social housing that we aspire to live in yeah. is one really important lesson. And I think the other one that a lot of architects are so interested in now is the notion of the street as the basis for the organisation of a project. That we're not building a wedding cake on a platter like in the Ville Radieuse, but we're connecting with the existing streets of the city. We're putting front doors onto streets. And talking earlier to Stephen, I think you had a, had a, um, a kind of take on our take on street-based housing, which I think might be interesting to, to bring in. Uh, yeah, I mean, the street Can you is, project? Up, please. Yes. Can, can oh. we project so that Neve can hear? The, the street is back in fashion, you know, in this country, in terms of uh, architects and regeneration teams and local authorities working in housing. But I find it really important to recognise what I see as a bit of a difference with the notion of, sh uh, of street in the late 70s that you could maybe see in Alexandria Road and, and other projects where um, there is an idea of continuity. It's an urban idea of connecting, which we all recognise. But there's also what comes with a street is a sense of proximity and I would say, in the best cases, density. And what I find radical in Alexandria Road, placed here this evening, is that it proposes a, a more intimate urban life, you know, a, an idea of intimacy that we would recognize in the European city. And I don't think that is an aspect that is being addressed in a positive way in the work that is generally being explored in this country right now under the umbrella of we're celebrating the street. So we have streets with cars and things that we recognize, but what we see in Alexandria Road is, is intimacy and proximity and the idea that a single system building, you know, a conglomerate building, can be greater than the separate parts, that you can be part of a bigger whole. And I think this inevitably links to social politics, social change, that the obsession with the, the, obsession with the individual or the growth of individualism means that I look at this and I think uh, I can't imagine it being ever accepted now for reasons of the fact that it's, I'm part of a much bigger system. You know, and I think that has changed. So, to me, that it's connected with an understanding of what street means. I mean, recently, we've been involved in a project in, in Harrow where we took the planning department to narrow streets and spaces to explain their qualities, to il illustrate their qualities, in order to uh, show precedent for a project that we were working on with two other architects to promote intimate street, an intimate street scene again, you know, a sense of density, a sense of urban life where you see your neighbour, you know, your, your shoulder, you're rubbing shoulders. And I, I find that a big loss. And I think in the, in the late 70s, when you think of other projects like Odom's Walk, for, amongst others, there is a, a, a celebration of togetherness and the idea of a community that is, that has to be there. You know, that you're, you have to know your neighbour. You know, when you look at Odom's Walk, there's a lot of diagonal views into things, which would be unacceptable now. And I think that's a shame. What I, could I just finish saying that what I found wonderful, Neve, in your introduction was the declaration that projects should not all meet the same code, that they can be specific and special. Because this is a special project. You know, there shouldn't be too many special no. of the same special project. And they, that, again, I'm afraid, I think, is somewhat missing. 
at the moment. I was lucky, him. unbelievably lucky, because I began with five houses as a housing scheme. At the end of a street that had to adjust to the scale of the street and a garden beyond that was communal. So we had the public space in front, semi-public at the very interval, front doors, the private scheme, the private terrace, and then the semi-private garden, unique and contained and safe for the children. And I did that house. That was a housing scheme. Then, luckily, lucky for me, Camden was set up, Sydney Kip came, they needed people, they saw my scheme at Winscombe Street, I met them and I got a job. Well, that was an incredible piece of luck. We then did Fleet Road, which was not like a group of houses, but was a housing scheme. It has the same windows, balustrades, details, ideas of staircase. It is, in a sense, a bigger elaboration to a housing scheme of the ideas generated at Winscombe Street. And then, finally, at Alexandra Road, where we get 520 dwellings, a school, a community centre, a public park, the integration of adjoining a state, a youth club, a building department, uh, department and other th extra parking, other things as well, as one great big complex. It too has the same windows, the same balustrades, the same details, the same attitude towards staircases, so they become a thesis in a way, at a small scale, at a middle scale, at a, the bigger public scale. And there are aspects of the bigger public scale that are alien to the small scale. There are aspects of them all that don't fit with each other, but the language fits all the way through, which happened to be my unbelievable good luck to be able to do that. The interesting thing being, if I may enlarge on that, we did the scheme, we designed it, we had a change in council. It was actually we had a Tory council in Camden for the acceptance of the scheme. We then had, the, and they endorsed it and loved it and applauded it. And we then had the changes that were going on in England at the time. We had the change of the director of housing from Rowley to, what was the name of the man? I can't remember, Max. I mean, I'll get back to you on that. And they, he employed a whole lot of new young people. Those new young people believed that you should never do big schemes, that you always talked with the group of people who you were going to be housing for. You designed in cooperation with them the small schemes that they wanted, and they were violently opposed to Alexandra Road. And they had surveys done. Now, I remember a group of their surveyors coming to see me saying, we have done surveys of the opinions of people and they want the kitchens by the front door and they want the kitchens with a linkage through at that level and they don't want upper kitchens at the back of the house. So please change the scheme. And we then ended in a period of almost total opposition to the council as we finished the scheme. Coming through finally, to the nightmare of the public inquiry at the end. But we were actually able to manage the building through to the end by a bit of deceit from time to time, the occasional, <laughs> the occasional sidestepping of rules and regulations, uh, the suppressing of bits of communication, <laughs> and the deceit that was necessary under those circumstances, which I shouldn't admit to, but, uh, but we did it. And we got the scheme through to the end. And then I had to go. <laughs> and we had the public inquiry. And I was a friend of Jim Sterling's, and we had a great big visit with Jim, and all his scheme uh, people came around the scheme. And at the very end of it, I sat there with Jim and Mary, and Jim said, what are you doing next? And I said, I don't really know. I'm going to private practice. He said, Neve, you will never get a building for at least 10 years, and probably never in England again because of the public inquiry. Later I met, uh, uh, that was Jim Sterling, Peter Smithson, and he told me the same thing. And it was true, I've never done another building in England. And, and what a loss. 
I have well, to say, Neve, yeah. what a loss, that your subsequent buildings have been outside the UK. It's, it's an absolute tragedy. Thing, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. But Peter, I wonder, would you like to comment? Because you were building at this time. You've built housing schemes going back right in fact, through to the 60s as well. This notion of, of the public, which Stephen was touching on, that actually this is, you know, these are streets, but they're streets with a very... Uh, which are very thick with social meaning and social ambition. Is that something that you think was, was widespread at that time? Um, I don't know whether it was widespread, but I do know that we were unbelievably uh, fortunate to be uh, coming out of the period immediately after the Second World That's War. Right with the Labour government, who basically met... Is that me? Somebody <laughs> telling me the wrong things. Um, <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. We can cut that out, I think. <laughs> Turn it upside down. <laughs> um, so, so there was there was the, that sense of the uh, the what's become the heritage of those five years of compressed amazing action in health, in housing, and in education, That's right. That's right. and which we are all gaining from, even as it's being destroyed slowly, a bit by bit, in the last 10, 20 years. Now, have I, do I have a view on the housing thing in relation to the public? One of the things that we became quite in interested in was the notion with large projects, how would you actually get to know how the people that will inhabit the building will feel about what you're trying to do? So, with both in housing at Charverton where we built for 5,000 people, having planned for 20,000. Later, in relation to the post office headquarters, uh, which never got built because the Labour Party had to save money. Uh, and then third, at Cummins Engines, a large, massive uh, diesel production plant, where, just to give an idea, we were actually intent with the client on finding out, I was determined to find out, because there was a workforce there already on the site. We were intent on finding out the, the attitudes of the workforce to their place of work. Could we find ways of having conversations with these people for whom we were building? They weren't the client, but they were the occupants, they were the workers. And it was with them, uh, through the client, that we set up meetings with the day staff, the night staff, the, the blue collar worker, the white collar worker, and drew from all that a sense of what their values were in relation to the building, in relation to their working output. And we could actually take that with the client and begin to actually ad adapt the brief to have a dimension that hadn't previously been there. That's, that's a kind of, that's one position in relation to the, the social dimension. I agreed with you, Mark, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, get into areas where I would be entering into a political territory. But it's not, it's not uh, I think it's a wonderful conjunction, a fortunate moment for Neve to be sitting here with his work in social housing. Um, and just a hundred years ago, in the October Revolution in, in, in Russia, we saw last night, Molly and I, the Eisenstein October film. So it's a nice kind of conjunction of moments. Now, when I spoke to Neve recently on the phone, after he'd asked me to come along, I wondered why me? Um, and, and, and I said, look, Neve, 
uh, if, have you got any special things you want me to say? And he said, are there issues that you want me to address? No, we'll just have a conversation. So I said, look, I must go back to Alexander Road. So I took my car, because that's where my buggy lives, in the boot. I took my car and parked it in Belsize Road, near the junction with Abbey Road. And on that junction, what you get are tower blocks, the very ones that you quite rightly regard as being an absurdity and a mistake in our cities. And so I started thinking about taking those buildings. What you did is turn them on their side, destructured them, shook them hard, <laughs> remade them, made a street to contain two of the tower blocks on their sides. You were lucky because the railway had a wonderful bend, so that bend was great in relation to your street. So there are issues there about uh, you also made a lovely bench on that street at low level. So for an old man, as it happens in the autumn sun, sitting there thinking about the modern movement, your work, incidentally I ought to say, uh, thank you for inviting me. Really I'm here in every way to celebrate your achievement. Just bloody marvellous, marvellous, thank you. <laughs> When I got out of my car in Belsize, stop me if I'm going on too long, but as I got out, got out of the car in Belsize Road, I looked, knowing where Neve's scheme uh, and Camden's scheme at Alexandra Road was, I walked along and looked between the late Victorian semi D houses, and there's a gap there of about, let's say, two and a half metres. So you can see through into the north side, the side where the structure does that, and holds the building as it, as it pulls backwards for the street. And I, in seeing that, and seeing the tower blocks at the corner of that junction, and knowing about your scheme lying beyond the rail track, I thought, well, that's what cities are. They are all sorts of things together, and we somehow have to find a way of moving forward now, back, both forward and back, to the values that made the social housing possible. Not affordable housing, social housing. Right. And, you know, affordable housing is not really affordable for many people. I went on and sat on your, one of your benches on that, on that street. The sun was shining, it was warm, and I thought about the modern movement. I thought about the constructivists. I thought about Braque and Picasso and the language that they had in that conversation between them over a period of, what, five years or so? I thought about the homogeneity of your materials the whole way through the building except for the paving, which is red brick, but everything else is concrete and some 50 mil diameter uh, handrails, that's about it. Glass and, and glass frame and, and timber and uh, metal frames. So, you know, there was a language there which was a language of a material which you can make anything of, almost anything out of that material. And you did so, and you made staircases that rose up from the street so that you actually got a sense of movement from the big street, from the pavement of the street, and moved up on the outside of the building, moving up into the places that you were going to inhabit, and making smaller chunks of concrete that size, which become balustrades for the, for the stairs. So there's a whole language I remembered in relation to that homogeneity of material once many years ago when I was in, with, with my partners-to-be. 
traveling towards Iran to look at some buildings there. And we were in mid-Turkey, uh, in the Anatolian plain. Arrived at a village, wanted to stretch our legs. I moved, started moving through the village, which was about two stories high, two or three stories high. Found myself walking slightly upwards and suddenly realized in all these mud buildings that I was actually on somebody's roof. And the whole thing about the notion of making a place out of one material, mud, which you can move over, or concrete in your case, was just amazing, amazing. And I thought back, therefore, to the beginnings of the modern movement and the meaning of concrete in relation to the making of new ideas, ideas that where you could make things really strong, columns, beams, walls, roofs, or you could make things relatively smaller for balustrades and the like. I think I ought to stop that one because, but, you know, there's, there's more to be said, but not now. Well, I think it's a very important point, Peter, that you've raised about the material choice at Alexandra Road, as we're talking, as we're looking at that at the moment, because one of the things that uh, is really appealing to a young generation today is the concrete. You know, there's this huge enthusiasm for concrete as a material, and so there's all the stuff that you're well aware of, Neve, all the brutalist revival, people talking about the buildings of this period as brutalism. And I think it would be interesting to hear your comments, firstly on the, the material, the concrete. Were there other materials that you might have used? Were you happy with it being homogeneous in the way that Peter says? And secondly, about this brutalism label, which is being now so widely applied to your work and other people's work. Well, the deal with <coughs> brutalism <coughs> to begin with, I've been talking, I did talk a little bit about detail on Alexandra Road as refined. Some things that were brought down very small. Some things that had double edges which didn't need to have them. Some things which had layers on them that were part of the architectural language, but not anything to do with what you, you would generally call brutalism. And brutalism was attached to a period of work. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I don't feel I'm a brutalist architect. I'm a different kind of architect from that. That's one thing. What was the other point? Well, about the concrete, the use of the well, homogeneous the of material. I mean, it had to be concrete. There was no question it could be something else. It could have been something on the inside and then something else on the outside. It was logical to me to make it concrete all the way through and to make it, as it were, a total concrete building. I should say that at that period in time, the director of housing, a man called Rowley was incredibly cooperative. He didn't understand at the beginning. We talked and talked and talked and talked, and he understood the scheme, and he got more and more involved in it. And all this time, we're talking about the passageways and the walkways uh, and the alleys that made up uh, the way uh, Fleet Road w w uh, worked. And before we went into the committee with uh, for me to describe the scheme. I remember he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Neef, whatever you do, don't to this committee refer to alleys, because mm. the committee will consider them to be working class and they'll turn the scheme down. So I call them passages instead. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, no, I mean, I don't like terms like brutalism. I don't like generalizations. <coughs> I'm trying to say that in any case, we have a program, or we had a program that was a program of what we were given, and we adapted the program to the circumstance. And all the things I'm saying now about the way we then re-adapt a new set of programs should be then adaptable within the programs themselves to the circumstance. And the fact that we have absolutely generalized strict rules about all sorts of things seems to me to be negative in the sense of responding to housing situations. Now, the first thing we need to do when we do housing 
is in effect, uh, is in effect to assess the scale and activity and its involvement in its bit. I have been lucky to go from five houses to 520. Mm. If you, whatever you do, wherever you do it, you make an assessment of its qualities and the neighborhood qualities and you move on with that. Some of that may be in opposition to another scheme down the road and we ought, I think, to adjust and a, a, a adapt a system that can do that. And I dislike hard and fast sets of rules because they set up standards that we can't justify. Mm. Right. May, may I just yep. uh, add to that? I mean, from the point of view of architects working now, m maybe most of the audience here, we can appreciate the sort of heroism in projects from the late 70s, which I can think of a few examples that have been deeply inspirational. They are full of experimentation, and they were able to be so. And I'm really interested, well, what I was going to say was, like, our challenge is what we do. How do we become experimental? Because it seems very difficult to find space in publicly paid housing to be experimental. Um, it's, the housing sector is so codified that you know, everything is controlled. And I mean, you're, if you're a certain type of architect, you're constantly trying to push, uh, push out of that constraint. And I am really interested to know, and maybe others are too, to understand at that time in the late 70s or the early 70s when when you were designing Alexandra Road, um, what support, if there was there support, and if so, what kind of support did you receive from Sidney Cook or his other his colleagues and collaborators, who effectively were the client base? Did you feel that you were encouraged to experiment? Staggeringly, yeah. That's By the wonderful say. man Sidney Cook. When we went there, and uh, the first thing I did when I went to Stanley Cook, Sydney Cook, was a uh, town planning scheme for the north part of Camden Town. And somehow or other that arrived on his desk, and he gave it to me, and I did a town planning scheme. And he invited then the director of planning, a man by the name of Dr. Schlaffenberg, who had been one of the important planners in the LCC. And he came in, and he sat there with his white face and quivering hands, and I described the scheme. And he slapped the table, and he shouted in uproar against the fact that the architects had intruded in the planning process. And he said this, and he said that thing, and he shouted a bit, and he got up and he walked out. And Sidney Cook sat there, moved, of course, but unhurried. And he said, well, that was that. We have, to, we have to live with that. Now, the point being that then when I had designed Alexandra Road and got it through to the right point, the planners hated it and said they would turn it down. And that was Schaffenberg and Sidney Cook. Now, always, councils went to committee joining up the planners and the architects. And Sidney Cook insisted that we would go alone. And that was his response to the planner walking out on us and the planning scheme. So that was the first thing. We then went with him to do then uh, um, Fleet Road and then Alexandra Road. But Alexandra Road was done and designed while he was still there. And he was wonderfully supportive. Not only was he wonderfully supportive, but at times, two or three times, when, for instance, after the change of council, and we had uh, the important Tories coming in and wanting to do it differently, and then we had had an important meeting, and I knew who was coming to that meeting. There were going to be two contractors, there were going to be people from planning, people from housing, others as a group, to persuade us not to do the things we wanted to do. Mm. And I thought, well, I will be quiet, and Sidney Cook will come in. And he put me, stood me up before we went in and said, you're doing the meeting. 
And I went in to this meeting, and we had these people there, and I had to somehow or other get through the meeting. I got through the meeting because we'd already had consent enough to say that we couldn't go back on it. But from that moment onwards, we were in total opposition to planning and to also the people in housing. We had to survive and get through that. We did. But you had enough support from the well, council, Cook, but not done. just Sydney Cook, but from the councillors. Oh, because in with. the end, the councillors, yes, not in the latter stage, yeah. but, but when, when you were getting Fleet Road through and Alexandra Road through, they were utterly, approving utterly it, weren't supported. they? Both the Labour ones to begin with, and then at the very end, we went to committee with Tories almost within the first week of the new Tory group. They were supportive, they applauded, they gave me support to begin with, and it was only when the Director of Housing changed and they brought in the new people, and then at the end, of course, um, what's the name of the councillor? Yes, what? the councillor. What? The councillor, yeah. Ken Livingston. What? Ken Livingston. Ken Livingston, who came in at the very end in total opposition to the scheme. And we had some terrible meetings, and he met the council, the people. They thought the scheme would be, he was advised by housing. They thought the scheme would be unlivable. They walked around it before it was completed. They decided they need to protect themselves, and they committed themselves to the public inquiry, which you probably know about. The public inquiry exonerated the architects, blamed the council. The council got the public inquiry, closed it up, put it on the shelf, and never published it. It's a, However, it it's, ruined yeah, me, so it's, it's, me kidding. It's a it is a terrible story, and it's really the point at which councillors and architects who had collaborated to deliver the welfare state, there was this terrible separation and Alexander Road became the kind of symbol of that and Neve was the, was the victim the of that whole that process. The councillors were publishing material accusing the architects of long-term incompetence and lack of control and lack of money control throughout the scheme. And it wasn't until the inquiry vindicated us and blamed the council. Yeah. But on this, this point about experiment and innovation, I wonder, Farshid, if you'd like to comment on this in relation to your experience in France, where, is, am I wrong? Is there, is there an interest in, in experimentation, in innovation? Did you find support from your clients on the, the two projects that you've completed? It's a very different model. They, they um, have an interesting um, um, uh, setup of delivering um, affordable housing um, through the pro private sector, but with a huge involvement from the public sector. So um, I think it may not be so dissimilar maybe in Holland, uh, where the, pub, the public sector sells um, uh, land uh, or invites bids uh, uh, from the private sector, uh, but this bid has both a kind of a, involves putting a price down for the land, but coming up with an architectural proposal. So uh, the decision for the plot has architecture as one of the equations, uh, which and, and because it goes through a competition, and because on the panel of the, of, of, of the judging panel, there is a master planner who is normally an architect or an urban designer, as well as uh, often the mayor, him or herself, and uh, the, the planners, uh, actually this, this, the, the, the project is um, selected from a very broad range of um, you know, concerns. So we don't have quite the same uh, situation as, as, um, as Alexandra Road, where it is really the, you know, the public sector delivering it, uh, and, and therefore the scales of them are not um, anywhere, anywhere. Uh, and, and therefore the impact they can have is, is nowhere quite the same. But I think it's quite interesting that when, when the individual private projects, private developments are, are, are delivered, they are also fitting within a larger Indirectly, uh, they are also implementing a larger vision for the city. So the building is housing is also making the city. And I think that, that on that front, 
it, it, it is through a very different route, I think they managed to, to, to deliver some of what I think Neve has always uh, you know, looked at housing, for, that housing is the city. Uh, and that it's not just about you know, accommodation. fitting in accommodation, yeah. exactly. I'm so sorry, I can't hear. Well, the, the point that <laughs> Farshid was talking about her experience in, in France, where, in France. Yes, where she's built two important projects. And in France, there's a comp it's a competition where the architecture is part of the submission and the master planner, a bit like in, in uh, Eindhoven, is on the assessment panel. And so the, the design is part of the basis on which this company gets to win and therefore to build. And that there's, she's saying that there's a recognition that in building housing, you are also making the city. Yes, yes. And that you're not just providing yes. certain units of accommodation, yes. but that you are, you are making the city. See, I'm so. in a dilemma about this, because I was in the initial part of doing Alexandra Road and my Fleet Road and my, all my schemes. Uh, I didn't have a problem of integration with others. It was simply what went on in my head. And in theory, I believe also in the way of doing it with housing associations and housing societies, and not just with councils. I believe absolutely in the integration of that. What I found personally difficult is modification of what you think the right values are as you go along, because you have a set of opinions. Now that's simply not my experience. My experience has been fortunate for me insofar as I've been able to do a proposition and, despite opposition, carry it through. The idea of the integration, which I do believe in, in theory, is not an experience I've had in fact. Uh, because sometimes the values when you put together a proposition are values very difficult to be understood by people who live, as it were, in normal kind of life and not maybe in that proposition. So how do you get the right impact for the creative idea that you are doing and not have to reduce it because of the, their opinion? Now that's not the dilemma I have had to suffer. But, I mean, th perhaps this is a point at which we might move on to the Eindhoven project, because surely for Eindhoven, you, had, you were invited to do it by Jo Kernan, but you had to get buy-in from the, from the town, from the, what's it called, the, the Beauty Committee? The Beauty Committee. <laughs> Will you tell us about the Beauty Committee? The Beauty Committee. The Beauty Committee was surprisingly undogmatic and, un, and, and, and not very... I mean, the, the Eindhoven scheme was done... Jo Kernan, who I got to know because he came to see Alexander Road years and years ago when he was a young man, and he is the director, of, the director of architecture for the state. We do not have a similar role. And he has authority and he can make decisions and insist on them. And he was somebody who I'd known. We had been many, many meetings and friendships with him in the Netherlands. And he asked me if I would design the big scheme for, uh, uh, for the Eindhoven scheme. And I did doodles and things and worked it out. And we talked and talked and we talked. And then he rang me one day and said, I am now the Director of Architecture for the State. I can no longer be Professor of Architecture at Karlsruhe. You will be the Professor of Architecture at Karlsruhe. And I said, oh, I can't possibly do that, I'm busy. He said, you are coming to a meeting next week. I have arranged for the meeting. So I got on the train and I went to the meeting. I thought, good old bloody mighty, what's going to happen? And they took me around the building to begin with and everywhere were all my sketches hanging on the walls. And we went down to the committee room, and we sat there at the committee room, and I said, this is supposed to be a full-time job, isn't it? He said, yes, yes. I said, I can't possibly do a full-time job. So they went into the little huddle, and they came back from the huddle, and they said, how much can you do? And I thought quickly and said, literally off the top of my head, without proper consideration, not more than three days every two weeks. 
And they went back into that little huddle, and they came back and said, that's fine. <laughs> so I did three days every two weeks with a lot of all night work. Uh, just, I mean, you know, both building the building in Eindhoven and teaching in the School of Architects there. And I had all sorts of friends come, John Miller, there was all, lots of people came and gave lectures and so forth and talked. And it was wonderful. Very, very nice. Well, Neve, shall we, um, shall we run through your <coughs> Eindhoven sequence? I'd love to. Yeah, have you still got your pointer? I have, I'm Good. not sure what I'm trying to do about the pointer, go on. That is the Eindhoven building. That is my friend Joe Kernan's building, not quite the way I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> that was an existing building, and he wanted what he called a Medina, a low building, and he came to me. So, on the one hand, is a, the absolute major road is a circuit which goes around Eindhoven, up the back, and up the top as an inner circuit. In that inner circuit are the old buildings, including an old buildings here, the cathedral. Where's the cathedral? God Almighty. There must be somebody there. Where they put the cathedral? Uh, it's up right up in the middle at the top. That's it. Somewhere up there. Yeah. Uh, then a new walkway that he put down here, underneath that building, and down there, and out. And the ancient old walkway there, in 19th century and some of it 18th century scale, so we have the, op the opposition of the main road against new commercial buildings on the one hand and stepping down to 18th century and 19th century housing on the other. So the obvious thing for me to do was to do a frontage <coughs> on one side and step down roof gardens on the other to a walkway that ran through at the same scale as the existing walkways, so that you had a circuit and then through in various ways. Next. And that's the other side, the terraces of private gardens which go up the building with their own apartments behind them, the final bit, bit here and the top bit there and there, and you're going there. Next. And that is the rough plan with garaging underneath commercial building, housing with studios and workshop spaces at ground level, four level, three level, three level. Interestingly, these are, divide the, the grid of the, of the plan, and that's the plan there, with its own walkway in the middle, and the upper walkway there, and the, this walkway coming through, and joining the scale, absolutely the scale, of the old village, village city on the other side. So it adjusts from this low building up to my building there. Next. And that is the long building, uh, the, the main frontage building, and the walkway, the colonnade underneath, and how to deal with the end. And then the interesting thing always, to go on. Next, Next building. Oh, that's a section which shows uh, garaging, extra garaging underneath, garaging, housing here with workshops and display onto the street, workshops and display onto the street, apartment, two-story apartment, roof gardens, and then you get that as an upper house. Living room, bridge, garden, courtyard, bedrooms, same thing, living room, bedroom, courtyard, garden, living room, bedroom, courtyard, garden, up to that with its own gardens there, and then big apartments on the top. So that it is, in fact, a series of stepping down of gardens down to a planted walkway at the end, housing at the end, which is the same scale as the housing behind it and the other walkway. So it's a totally adjusted to the conformity of the city. Next. And that's going around the corner from what I showed you. That's the overhang. And then how you adjust the side of a building to step down and step down and step down and turn the corner at the end with the garage entry at that point. Next. And that goes around the corner to the walkway. 
and then the lower buildings here, three stories that the roof garden, roof garden, roof garden, roof garden, planting that goes up grids <coughs> up the side of the building. So the whole building was thought of as a series of layers, a series of gardens, and a continuous garden all the way up. Next. And that was the plan which shows the office space and the housing and the private courtyard and the housing in front. And on top of that would be the gardens for the upper dwellings there. Next. And that shows one of the upper terraces looking out its window across its courtyard to its own garden. The same thing here, across its courtyard to its own garden out there. Next. And that's it from the walkway side, the long walkway. These are display workshops for artists and the people who are craftsmen who live in the housings along there. Same thing on the other side. Uh, and then the gardens above on the terraces. Next. That is the terrace gardens above. As they, they step down, one like that, one like that. Uh, and it was interesting because we had the idea that we talked about it, they said, they would classify three areas of planting. The first area of planting would not be touchable by the people who lived there, and it would be the main edges. The second level would be protected, but people could adapt it within the dwelling. And the third would be the small terrace planting that people could do their own way. And they have maintained that for the life of the building. 10 years, and people subscribe to it. And take it on board. Next. And, and just to interrupt there, it is the planting, as you can see, is fantastic. Yeah. And it's maintained collectively. Good. So you can have somebody who's lousy at gardening, but they can't wreck it for everybody else because there's a one meter strip yeah. around their lousy bit of gardening, they which is, ma is collectively <laughs> maintained. And, and they so, did that. Yeah. They did that. And that's the higher housing at the end with its gardens. Next. So it fits the city. That's the walkway up to get into the housing. And then, walk, then there's lifts at the end. Next. And that is the end. Medina, Moss, Moody, Slotis, me, <laughs> and Yukon. And, and then where's Spazio? Is there another one? No, I think that's the last well, one. You have, to, you have to tell them what that says. Well, everybody knows what that means, don't Do they? they? Who knows what that means? Surely. I don't know what that means. What does it mean? There's somebody here who knows what it means. Medina was more slotster. Well, is that? <laughs> I think you're still talking Dutch. So tell what it means. brilliant final chapter. I think what you're trying to say. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I finished the building. I closed my practice complete. I didn't have many people there. Went to art school and gave up thinking much about architecture altogether, not because I wanted to give it up, but because I was involved in what I was doing next. And what I was happening astonished me. Because I thought the buildings that I had done after Margaret Thatcher were simply those pieces of the past, you know, that are kind of relegated and looked at with a degree of curiosity. And I had no idea that they were still being looked at not only as bits of the past but something which might be relevant to the present and the future and so i was dumbfounded by the fact that all of this has happened to me in a sense at the end of my life
Well, what a fantastic evening that's been, Eve. It's such a, such a real treat to hear you talking about your work. And I think we can still sense that, that vitality and that energy which, has, which drove you to make those incredible innovations and those wonderful places to live. And it's just, I think it's such an inspiration for us 50 years on. I mean, it was September 1967 that Fleet Road was published and you wrote The Form of Housing to go with it, which is still a fantastic text. I mean, it was 50 years ago, and yet that still speaks to us Absolutely. No one is really saying it as clearly and as powerfully and as crisply as you. And that, I'm sure, is why there are so many people want to come and hear you talk tonight. And it's been a real treat for me, and I'm sure I speak for my fellow uh, respondents here. Yes. It's been a real treat to be part of the platform with you. So, Neve, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.